Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Um, this is the second part of the Ubermark tutorial series, uh, second of the three installments. Uh, so this will continue where we left off last time. Your instructor is Dr. Marianne Begg from the University of Southampton. Uh, we have two moderators today. Uh, you will see them in the participants panel. Uh, they have uh, the word moderator in front of their names. Um, Hans Fangor and Ryan Pepper. They're ready to take questions. So if you have a question, please don't send it to everybody. Send it uh, through chat to one of the moderators. Uh, usually a moderator would have a thumbs up icon next to their name. That means uh, uh, that moderator is ready to take questions. Uh, if you have a technical question like a problem with sound or Zoom controls, you can, uh, you can send it to me. I'm Kirill Belashenko, so I'm listed as a host at the top of the participants panel. Send it to me privately through chat as well. Uh, the uh, session will take about an hour and a half. We'll make a short break in the middle uh, after about 45 minutes. Um, so I think we can, uh, we can start at this point. Marianne, please go ahead. Great. Thank you, Kirill. So today we start with session number two, and I will quickly go through organization part just to remind ourselves about some rules. First thing, we acknowledge IEEE Magnetic Society support and Shin and Kirill for all the hard work organizing the workshop. Again, people, I'm Marian Bag, and they are Ryan and Hans, who you should be able to find in Zoom chat, send your questions directly to them. They are going to answer as many questions as they can. The questions they don't answer, I will try to answer later. Or, and then in the end, if you don't get an answer during a live session, you please raise an issue in the workshop repository. So this is the just summarized. So today the plan is to look at micromagnetic models and drivers and a little bit of, of data analysis. Everything else is basically the same as the previous one. So there is a workshop repository. You can run everything in the cloud. So you don't need to install anything on your machines. If you want to install their YouTube tutorials for three operating systems, please follow those. I think it is, it, it, it should work. We didn't get much complaints about about uh, that something doesn't work so we, we believe it's, it's it's fine and another thing we recommend is google chrome so on mac os safari recent update something is messy with widgets and, and colors so we recommend using google chrome for jupyter notebooks so the plan for today is we're basically going to be building on top of we did last week as i said we have, we're going to focus on micromagnetic models and drivers, so how to define different things. But I as we go through tutorials in notebooks, I will try to smuggle in some data analysis and visualization just because we can't work without those. And then in session three, I will go into details for those. And yeah, so now I will go to my browser here it is i hope you can see it so again quick thing in the workshop repository if you scroll down a little bit there should be all the instructions binder badge is this one you click on that and you open a binder session where you can go through tutorials make your own notebooks so this is the the link one thing is there, there have been a few questions. So I lied to you last time because I thought, for example, when you go to slides and then you click on slides.pdf, there is this download button and you click on it and it downloads. And that's true. And I thought that's true for all the files, but somehow if you go to say tutorials and then you click on one of the notebooks, you don't get that button. So there are some tricks how you can do that. So you can click on raw and then download as a, as a text file to your machine. But the more convenient way is if you're not using Git, here is this clone button. So you can clone if you're, you can clone the repository if you're using Git, 
or if you're not, then you can just click on download zip and it downloads the entire repository as a zip file. And then you unzip it and find the notebooks and tutorials subdirectory. Second thing I want to mention is if you go to issues and you open it, there are no issues. The reason for that is that when we answer any questions, we close those issues so they don't stay open. But here, if you go to closed, there you can see the issues that were raised and that we answered. We still get many questions via emails. I would say the ratio is one to five. So to each question we get on GitHub, we get five emails. So I would like to ask you, there is nothing bad about it, but if you can try to raise issues in the GitHub repository, the reason for that is that if you have a question, there is a high chance somebody else has the same question. And another thing is that we like to keep everything public and documented. So any discussion we have with users, we like it, we want it to be there as a permanent record of problem solving and that problem was reported. How did we deal with the problem? So yeah, nothing bad with sending emails if you don't like to create a GitHub account and raise issues. Another thing, if you want to remain, remain uh, anonymous, you can just create an account with any username. So you can hide behind an avatar. There's no need to, to say your name or anything. So yeah, but if you, prefer sending emails, it's, it's also fine. Okay, so now let's start. Here's the binder badge. I click on the binder badge, but I'm actually going to work on my machine. But if you are going to use binder, then click on that link. So here we have session two. As you can see, we have nine tutorials we want to go through today. Uh, the First one I think is really important. I will go through it. This number two and three, I will leave for the end. I put them here just to have them in a nice order of importance, but I think they're relatively easy. We covered most of that the last time. So I will skip those. And if we have any time left, then I will go through those two in the end. Then we are going to have a look a little, a little bit at vortex dynamics and how to define spatially varying parameters, periodic boundary conditions, and then we're going to move uh, the main wall. And then in the end, what we want to do is we want to uh, create a geometry, which looks like this. Let me first turn off some here, try to make it larger. Yeah, so we want to create a geometry which looks like this. Put the domain wall pair in the narrow part. Then we want to apply current, spin polarized current in the, in the X direction, and then push that domain wall pair into the wider region and see what we're going to get. So the goal for today is basically that we put the domain wall pair in the narrow part and we push it with the current and we see it transforms, transforms to a skirmium. So as the time progresses, we convert it to a skirmium. Now, the building blocks to do this exercise should be in, all, in the tutorials we're going to be covering today. So you should be able to do it in the end. I, the notebook is there with solutions. If you want to do it, you can do it on your own. If you don't, you just have a look at the solutions. Okay, so now let's start with the tutorial number one, which is magnetization field. <clears throat> so last time we discussed the, we discussed how to define an initial magnetization. We said it is a field object, which it lives in discretized field package. But we didn't say what should we do if we want to make it spatially varying, what, we, what should we do if we want to make, don't want to simulate a, a cube, what if we want to simulate a sphere. So in this tutorial, I'm going to cover those basics. So how do we start? Anything which has to do with fields, vector fields, scalar fields, meshes, regions, boundary conditions, that all lives in discretized 
field package. I import it and here I say SDF just to keep the name short because I'm lazy to type. Now, the first thing we want to define is the region. And the region is always cubic. And basically we just need to pass two points between which the region spans. So if we say that our region is between X coordinates are between zero and 100 nanometers, Y is between minus 20 and 20, and Z is between zero and 10, then we can choose these two diagonally opposite points. We could have chosen different ones. We could, we could have done zero, 20, zero, and 100 minus 20, 10. Doesn't matter, just we need two diagonally opposite points. The restriction here is the one, all, all the edge lengths must be greater than zero. So how do we do that in Ubermag? We define two points, P1 and P2. In our case, they are tuples. Tuples, it means they are in these rounded brackets, three numbers separated by comma. It can be anything. It can be a list, it can be uh, an iterable, can be uh, a NumPy array. For simplicity, I keep it as a tuple here. And then we define the region. So we say df.region classes always start with capital letter. And then in brackets, we pass to two points. We could have done this, but you will see it's much better if we are explicit and then we say P1 equals P1 and P2 equals P2, just because some unusual errors can occur if you, when you don't know where your tuple is going to end. Okay, so we define the region. Oh, I didn't run this cell. We define the region. Now region has, now our region object is in this variable and there are lots of different things you can do with the region object. As I mentioned the last time, so region is an object and you can say region dot tab and then here you can see all the functions and methods and attributes however you want to call them there are and you can ask for let's say uh yeah mpl and then you put a question mark and that opens here uh, the, the documentation what each argument means how to call the function there is usually there is always a small example in the end so if you don't know what to do, how to call a function, and you don't want to go online, look for tutorials, or look at the, read the docs documentation, just put region dot or any object dot tab, look what there is. You don't know how to call it, put a question mark, and then you should be able to, to find it. Here, I will quickly go through some properties. So we can ask for the minimum point of the region. We can ask for the maximum point of the region. In our case, they are the same as P1 and P2. We can ask for the region center. We can ask for the, the edges. Everything is in SI Eugen, so everything is in meters. Uh, most, objects in, uh, most objects in Ubermag have two ways how they can be visualized. So they can be visualized using matplotlib, and then you call dot mpl or they can be visualized using k3d and then you call dot k3d matplotlib is a quasi 3d plot but it's actually a, a nicely arranged 2d plot it's not interactive you can't rotate it and it's not very good with with ratios and proportions so you can see here the z the the thickness of the sample is much smaller than the x and y direction but this is just to give you a a feeling about the region. What is nice with matplotlib plots is they are nice to they're nice to to print, to save, and things like that. So then the K3D is another thing. K3D gives you a 3D visualization. So in our case, it's a it's a it's a cubic region, thin film. And now, last time, I think I didn't cover those controls. So you get this small window most of the things or basically all of the things you find in these controls you can control by passing arguments to k3d functions but it's sometimes just a nice thing to have a look here so 
things you can do is you can make screenshots, snapshots, reset cameras, detach widgets. So that means it opens in a new, in a new window. So it's not stuck inside your notebook anymore. You can go full screen. Uh, these are maybe not that important. Yes, one thing that you should be careful a little bit about. So, so our this is for this is for all K three D plots. So here you can see that the the color should be the same for all sides of the region, but because there is light in the in the plot then usually you get one edge darker than the other, which is not very good when you plot scalar fields and when you worry about the colors. So then here you can turn off the light or, yeah, and then everything should be the same. But if the light is on, then you get those shades. Uh, you can do the clipping. So you can do the, the clipping, uh, but we like doing that via via code i'm going to show you that then if you have many objects in the same plot then you can change the opacity of certain parts of some parts of your plot just to see better the others there are outlines which are not important in our case you can turn off change colors yeah but i think it's self-explanatory basically have a look into to that but those details how to set up different parameters of the plot by passing argument to K3D functions, I'm going to cover in the next tutorial. Okay, now we defined our region. The next step, we define the mesh. What is the mesh? Mesh is region plus discretization. And there are two ways how we can discretize the sample. We can pass the size of an individual cell, or we can pass the number of discretization cells we want in each direction. The each of those has its benefit, pros and cons. With cell, it is a little bit tricky when you, because you, the, the, your region has to be, you, you should be able to divide your region into those cells. So if your region is, let's say 10, and you want to divide it into cells of three, you don't get an integer when you divide it. So you will get an error with n that doesn't happen, but yeah, we have both options. So here we define the cell. Cell is 10 by 10 by 10 nanometers. And then mesh, df.mesh, capital M. We pass the region we just defined and we pass this cell from here and then we define the mesh. Few simple things again. Mesh is a um, much more complicated object. So there are lots of different things you can, you can, you can ask mesh to do, but some basics you can ask for n so how many discretization cells there are so we have 10 in the x direction four in the y and one in the z and if you ask for the length of the mesh you get the total number of discretization cells same story visualization mesh.mpl you get the plot in matplotlib with not that nice proportions there are way how you can change that by passing matplotlib axes and changing the, the, the size, but that's for the next time. And there is a K3D. K3D just gives you, again, the blue region, and then we just paint one cell to be orange to give you the, the idea of the ratio of the cell size with respect to the region. And again, region we pass to the mesh is now the part of the mesh object. So anything you can do on regions, you can do, you can still do on them through the mesh object. So you basically say from the mesh, give me the region. And then in that region, you can ask for its, I don't know, edges or the center. You're going to see through all the tutorials, we use these dots a lot. So I think it's quite intuitive. No, no need to, to worry much. Okay, now when we define the mesh, then what we do next is we define the field. And this is where all the magic happens. To define the field, we need to pass at least three arguments. So we need to pass the mesh. So the mesh we just defined. We need to the, pass the dimension of the value via dim. If, oops, 
if dim is one, it means it's a scalar field. If dim is, if dim is three, it's a vector field. This number basically means how many numbers are stored per cell. So for vector, we store three, three values. And then you pass the value of the field. And the whole point of this tutorial is to have a look at what this value can be. So if we want to define a, a uniform field where it, to each cell we're going to assign one vector in one zero zero direction, then we pass just a tuple to it. Again, here it's a tuple, it can be anything. It can be a, a, a list, an numpy array, any iterable, just it has to be length three if the dimension of the field is three. Okay, so now we here we defined a, a uniform field and now we're going to visualize it somehow. So if I just do this, m.mpl, I'm going to get an error, which tells me the field must be sliced before it can be plotted. The reason for that is matplotlib is a 2D plot. And then if you just pass a 3D sample to matplotlib, it doesn't know what you want to show. So you must pass uh, a sliced field. How do you slice the field? You slice it using plane. So let me just get rid of this. So I say m dot plane, where m is the field we just defined here. And then here in plane, two main things you can play with. One is, let's say we want to cut it in the z direction, where z is zero. And then this gives us as a result, a new field object. And then we say that field is now sliced. So we know on which plane of the field we are. And then we say dot MPL, and then we can plot, plot the field. Uh, here, if I'm just going, if I'm going to cut through the middle of the sample and I don't want to think, is it zero? Is it 10? What is it? Then I can just pass Z as a, as a string like this. And then it's always going to cut it through the middle. And you can see it's in the one zero zero direction. So Z means we cut the plane perpendicular to the Z axis or we show X, Y plane. On these plots, we see the X, y, X and Y components of magnetization and the color is the out of plane component. In our case, it's MZ. Okay, similarly, K3D. Now with K3D plots, you can see I don't need to pass a plane. So I don't need to cut the plane and tell K3D how to orient my plot because K3D is, is a 3D plot. Uh, here, this hat size is something for the next session, basically just tells me how big my arrows should be. So if K3D is not smart enough to figure that out on its own, then you just need to help it a little bit and say, okay, I want it larger or smaller. Okay. Now fields have lots of different things. So if I go M dot, and then you can see lots of different things. You can do mathematical operations with it. You can co compute curls, derivatives, divergence, Laplace. Uh, I will go through it a little bit later when, when we compute Skirmian numbers. You can ask for topological charges. You can compute volume integrals, surface integrals. You can write to field to different files to VTK, OVF, uh, HDF5. You can ask for individual components. So this is something which might be interesting. So if, so M, if I just ask for M, it is a field object with dimension three. So it's a vector field. But if I just want to extract an X component, I do go, I do M dot X and then I get the new field, but now it's dimension one. So I just get a scalar field. So for example, if I think we had average here, so M dot average gives me the average of the entire field. Okay, more details about that later. And now is our field is in one zero zero direction, as we said, but we didn't specify the norm. And in 
in, uh, in, in Ubermag, when you want to specify magnetization saturation, this is the place where you need to do that. So when you define your field, you pass the mesh, value dimension, and the value, and then you need to specify the norm. In our case, I put the norm to be eight times 10 to the six. It is always amps per meter, and I pass it here. It must be a scalar, so you can't pass a tuple. And now if we ask for, the, for an average, this is the average. So we set it with this value, but then normalize all cells to be with this norm. The cells where, where, the, where zero vectors are, the, the zero vectors are, are stored are ignored. So we don't normalize those cells. So value where value is zero, zero, zero has higher priority than setting the MS. Okay, now how, what do we do if you want to specify a spatially varying field? Here in value, as I said, we passed, here we passed constants. So we passed a tuple here and we passed a scalar there. But this can be basically anything. It can be any callable. So you can write a function. It can be a file. It can be another field or yeah, many different options. It can be a, a whole NumPy array. So many different options, but if you, most often thing we do is we specify spatially varying fields using Python functions. How do we write Python functions? Def space function name in brackets, we put the, the argument. Here I call it a point. And now this function here has to be defined for any point that is passed to M value. So if we use if and else, we must be sure that it covers all the cases or all the points our mesh has. And here, what I do, x, y, z equals point, I just unpack the point. So I don't want to call point of zero, point of one, point of two. I just say x, y, z, and then I can do some, say here, very simple. If y is greater than zero, I want it to be in one, zero, zero direction. Otherwise, I want it to be in that direction. And now I pass, this function name as a value to my field. Now what happens internally, field is going to call this function for each point in the mesh and function is going to return one of those two and then field is going to set the value of that cell to be that value. Now, if I plot it, this is the plot so for y greater than zero, we have in one zero zero direction. For y less than zero, we have it that way. Okay, now the field object is a callable itself. So you can treat it as a, how to say, as a function, let's say, and you can pass a tuple to it. And then field is going to tell you what is the value of the field at that point. So if you say, this is my point, as a tuple and then you pass that point to M, it, should, it is going to give you the, the value at that point. Sometimes, yeah, for example, it doesn't have to be a tuple like that. So you can say M and then I want to know what is the value of the field at the center. So I can say M dot mesh dot region dot center. And then it tells me, okay, at the center, this is the value. Now, spatially varying MS, exactly the same story. Just now our new, our function doesn't return a vector. So it doesn't return a tuple, it returns a scalar. So here for this example, we want to define a sphere, which is, uh, which has 50 nanometer radius. I, very made it very simple so 10 by 10 by 10 cells what do we do we define the region here i go from minus r to plus r in all three directions then we pass that region to the mesh and we say how do we want to discretize it this is our function and here you can see basically the sphere is here so if x squared plus y squared plus z squared is less than the radius squared that means we are inside the sample and then we return ms otherwise we're going to return zero so it means we are outside the sample and 
this is the field mesh dimension three value we set it to be constant here and this is the function name we just defined here now if, if i plot it z plane i get something like this you can see because there are not many cells it looks the edges are quite rough but that's what i wanted to show you and Another thing you can do in K3D, there is non-zero thing. So you can say M dot norm, and that gives me MS basically for each cell. And then K3D non-zero function is just going to plot those discretization cells where MS is non-zero. So this is a, 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 a nice function to quickly examine if your MS is right. So yeah, m dot norm dot k three d non zero. And here a quick example how to define a disk. I won't go into details. You can go through it yourself. And here is an exercise if you want to to go through it. How to define some random region with both ms. Yeah, but the story is the same for. For most of those. Now I'm going to go through tutorial to tutorial number four, which is vortex dynamics. As I said, energy equation and dynamics equation, I will do if we have time in the end. They are quite simple, but I just wanted to put them there for completeness. So I'm now going to vortex dynamics. Now, last time when we did the 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 first Uber Mac notebook, we just called, we, we, we use the driver only once. So we put some initial magnetization, then we relaxed the system. And we looked at what the relaxed magnetization is. Here, I want to show you how you can call drivers one after another. So how to do multiple drives in the same, in the same notebook. Another thing is in this notebook, I try to smuggle some data analysis tools just to make it more interesting. So the sample we want to simulate is 100 by 100 nanometers in X and Y direction. And it's a thin film, five nanometer thickness. The material is permalloy. These are the parameters. So magnetization saturation, exchange energy constant, gyrotropic ratio and Gilbert damping. Now, it is very important how we initialize our system. So micromagnetics is zero temperature and it is just going to go to the, to the closest or how to say, to the energy minimum, the local energy minimum. So you have to be smart when you define the initial state. So you always try to make it look like something like something that resembles what you expect and then you relax that state and for the vortex state this is the state we're going to use so at every point mx my and mz components are going to be this where y and x are the coordinates in the sample and c is just some constant to get rid of nanometers so it's basically just 10 to the 9 1 over meter and here is just 10, just to put some constant, not that important. So what we're going to do, we're going to initialize the vortex, we're going to relax it, then we are going to apply the field in the positive x direction, relax it again, the vortex is going to move, and then we're going to turn off the field, and then we're going to call the time driver, and then we're going to record the Record the magnetization to see how the how the vortex goes back to its in, to its uh, its initial position. Okay, quickly, how do we start? We import a discretized field for fields, meshes, regions, micromagnetic model for system, energy equation, dynamics equation, and we import umfc as a MC. MC here means as a micromagnetic calculator, and UMC is basically just a translator which takes the micromagnetic model and discretized field and translates to the language UMF understands. The geometry 
is this. So 100 nanometers in X and Y direction, thickness is that. MS, as we said, exchange constant, dynamics, gamma naught, and alpha. Uh, first thing we do is we define the system object. We say system equals MM. MM is for micromagnetic model dot system. And here we put the name of our system. This name is the name of the directory which is going to be created on our in our local directory where we store all the results of different drives and then later we can go to that using micromagnetic data package and analyze those individual drives. So try to be smart when you define those and also be careful if you already have a directory with that name, it can be overwritten and yeah, so be careful when you, when you do these things. Energy equation, what do we do? So we say system.energy and here we just put the sum of individual energy terms. In our case, we just have exchange and DMAC for simplicity now. So we say mm.exchange, the parameter is A and mm.dmag, no parameters here. Dynamics equation, system.dynamics, two terms we have precession and we have damping. Now gamma naught is the one we defined here but you can also use it from the consts. So mm.const, and here you can see there are lots of available constants you can use. So you can just use it like that. No need to define it separately, but yeah. Let's try to be as clear as possible. So this is our energy equation, our dynamics equation. The last thing we need to do is we need to specify the initial magnetization. First thing we do, we define the region. The region, here I put it between minus L over two to L over two in X and Y direction and thickness is between zero and, and thickness. Now I pass that region to my mesh and say, I want this to be my cell. It's quite big, but should be fine for permaloy. And Initial magnetization, if you remember, we wanted it to be something that is going to give us a vortex when we relax the sample. So this is the function. This is the name. It can be anything. So this is something you, you choose. It takes one argument. That argument is always a tuple. Here we unpack the tuple. This is the constant we defined when I said it's 10 to the, 10 to the 9. And we return this maybe just to be more explicit i should have put it like that just to make it clear it's a it's a tuple so it returns a vector minus c times y c times x 10. and now we pass that function name to the value when we define the field object for magnetization and norm is just ms so it's it's a cubic sample it's a, it's a single scalar. Again, you can inspect different things of the objects. You can ask for system.energy, system.dynamics, just to be sure if everything is as you wanted. You can plot the, magnet, the initial magnetization. You can see it looks like a, a vortex, so the, our initial state is quite good. But at this point, we do the relaxation. So, Two main drivers are minimization driver and, and uh, time driver. Minimization driver, first you need to create a min driver object. So you say MD equals MC dot min driver. MC is a micromagnetic calculator. calculator. In our case, it's on C. And then from that object, you say MD dot drive, and then you pass the system object you just created. Now drive is going to take the system, look at all, all its properties, equations and initial magnetization, going to translate it to language umf understands, run umf, and then it's going to umf, when, it, when umf gives us the, the results, it going to, it's going to load those results back to the system object. So now if we drive the system and plot it again, so I say system.m, so give me the magnetization, the new one. 
slice it with the plane perpendicular to the z-axis and plot it using matplotlib. And when we plot it, we get, we get our work next. Now, we said, so there is no applied field and the vortex is at, is at the center. Now we want to add an in-plane field to move the vortex core. So we're going to apply the field in the X direction. How do we do that? So this is the field we're going to apply. So it's in the X direction, 10 to the four, X direction, 10 to the four amps per meter. And now all you need to do is just say the system.energy plus equals mm dot zeman, which means add this term to our energy equation. And what you do after that, you just drive the system. So MD, we already have it defined from the previous drive, M dot drive. In the next tutorial, I'm going to show you different things, how you can change parameters of drivers and evolvers. For now, we're just going to, to, to trust the default parameters, but anything you can do in oomph, you can change in oomph, you can change through Ubermac here. And yeah, if we run it again and plot it, we see that our vortex score went up. So the field is in positive X direction. So this region grew and this region got narrower. And that's why our vortex went up. Now, what do we want to do is now we want to turn off the field and record the dynamics. How do we do that? Let me just have a quick, uh, quick thing here. So this is our system object. If I say system dot, again, lots of different things. If I go to energy and I say dot again, I can find the energies I defined already. So I have DMAC, I have exchange, and I have Zeman. So if I go to Zeman and press dot and tab again, Zeman has, next time we're going to look at how to compute densities, the energy densities, effective fields, but here what we're interested in is in this, is this H. So this is the field we applied. It's 10 to the four, if you remember. Now, if I want to change that, I just need to do this. So I say system.energy.zeman.h, and now I set it to zero. Another thing I could do, I could have done is I could have done system. Maybe let me show system.energy minus equals and then mm.zeman and h equals h. So I could have just subtracted that term from my energy equation. But here, I wanted to show you this trick. So any parameter you want to change for any energy or dynamics term, system dot either energy or dynamics dot a little bit of tabs and you should be able to find the parameter you want to change and then equals and then the new value. Now, this is the first time we're, we're, we have time driver. So we define, we say TD equals MC MC is OOMC in our case and time driver. And then we say td.drive. Now for the minimization driver, we had only this. So we had only system. But now for the time driver, again, lots of things you can specify here, but basics. How long is our simulation? So we want to simulate it for five nanoseconds and we want to record the magnetization in 500 steps. And now if I run this, it's going to run the, going to run oomph and yeah, well, yeah. okay, it's done. And now I can plot what is my new, new magnetization. So if you can see now it went back to the center. Okay, so this is how inside the same notebook you can have multiple drives, change the parameters, change the energy equation between different runs and play with it. And now for the end of this notebook, I just want to show you some data analysis things. So two things, one is the, the final magnetization. The final magnetization is in system.m. 
So this is the last saved point, sorry, the last saved step, so to say. And it's in system.m. And if, if you have a look, it is a field. And then you can do with it whatever you want. Compute curls, derivatives, plot it, whatever. Now the scalar data is saved inside system.table. So if you have system.table, you get something which looks like this. And it's a little bit ugly. It shows you some columns. But this is a string representation. If you want to get a nice, a nice table, you have to type table.data, and then you get, get it as a pandas data frame. And here you can see these are the steps we had. It made it shorter, so it skipped some parts here. So we had 500 steps, so the first one was zero, the last one was 499, and these are all the parameters that were saved during the run. So we want now, let's say, to plot mx, my, and mz as a function of time. So time is this last column here. So what do we do? So this is the same thing I just typed. So what you can do, you can just say system.table. And again, most objects have this MPL. MPL, put the question mark and have a look what you can pass to it. Here, I just show you these, this thing, more details next time, is I just want to plot MX and NY columns from, columns from my table here. So I pass a list and I say, just give me MX and NY. And then it gives me a quick plot. As a last thing before the break, I just want to quickly introduce the micromagnetic data package. So as I said, maybe if we go to, to homepage, when we ran the simulation, Ubermac created this vortex dynamics directory. So this directory here, it has the same name as the name we gave to our system object. Now, if we go inside, we have different drives. The drives start from zero and then one and then two. So here we have three drives. If you remember, the first two were minimization driver and the third one was the, the, the time driver. So if you go to one of those, you can see lots of input files and output files from UM for from UMAX and what Ubermac created. And micromagnetic data is a package which gives you some nice convenience functions how you can analyze those drives later. Again, this is a topic for the next for the next session, but here I think it's nice to just show you it can be useful not to wait for so long. So this is a package. So we import micromagnetic data and here I give it a shorter name, MD. And the main object is data. So I say data equals MD.data. And then I here I pass the system.name. So this says it expects a string. So I can just say system.name and then this is the name I gave to my object. So this creates a, a data object and now you can just ask data.info and then it's going to give you okay it's you had three drives these were the times you used minimization driver the first two times and then you use the time driver and then here you're going to get extra columns for all the extra parameters you passed for your drives so for minimization driver if you remember we didn't pass any extra extra values so that's why we had none here this means not a number but for the time driver, we had the total time and the number of steps. And now let's say we want to analyze this time drive. So this time driver, so drive number two. What I can do, I can say, maybe let's just do this. So I can say from data, give me dot, give me the drive number two. And this gives me a drive object. Now from this drive object, again, lots of things are in there, but you can ask for, I think you can ask for, oops, info, and then you get a dictionary of different parameters. You can ask for initial magnetization that was used. Again, this is a field, and then everything you can do with those fields, 
you can do like this here. You can ask for, I think you can ask even for a MIF file. Yeah, you get a MIF file, but if you want to have it nicely printed without these new line characters, you can just do it like this. And then if you're not sure how to write a MIF file for OOMF, you can write it here in, in Ubermag and then just ask for a MIF file and then gives you gives you yeah, lots of different things here. But what I wanted to show you here is that this drive object, oh, I deleted it, right? Yes. So our drive we want to look, have a look at is data.drive and want to have a look at drive number two. So this is now our drive, but I could have just done this. Maybe it's better to keep it. Sorry about that, made a mess here. So in our data, give me the drive number two and then give me the step 199, which is 200th step because we start from zero. This is going to give me the field, give me a field and then we're going to cut it with the plane in the Z direction and then we're going to plot it. And this is what the magnetization was at 200th step. So, but now if we can make it interactive so you don't, if I want to see what was at zero, what was at one, so you don't have to change it. There is a way how you can build interactive plots. More details the next time, but here I wanted to introduce it in this, this order. Here is the solution, but I'm going to build it from scratch just to make it clear. And then we're going to have a break, I promise. So this is the line we called, okay? So when I run this, I get, this was the magnetization at step one. Now this is something I want to change. So I'm going to call it N, or I'm going to call it a step, or just give it some name. Then I'm going to put this line inside a function. I'm going to call it my plot. And this parameter I want to change, I expose it as a function argument. Now, if I run this cell, nothing happens because I have to call this function my plot and then pass two, and then it's going to plot the magnetization at second step. Now, to, to make this function interactive, what you can do is you can, in Python, it's called decorated. So you put this, this at, and from discretized field, you call interact decorator and now you say what n is next tutorial i'm going to give you an overview of all the widgets so lots of these things here you can change using those widgets and you can build your own widgets but here we can say n is from our data and give me the drive number two and for that drive give me the slider and now if i call it i get the plot but I also get this slider here. And now as I, when I move this slider, I can show different steps. You can also put some play buttons here. And yeah, the reason we do it this way is because then you can build interactive plots any way you want. So you're not stuck to our uh, user interface for plotting, but basically you can build your own interactive plots. You can expose different things. You can change the colors, change the color maps. So, but the recipe is this. Plotting line, put it inside a function and expose what you want to change. So n comma, I don't know, axis and color. So everything you want to change and then df.interact. And here you define all those things. So each of those is a, is a widget and then you just pass you define those widgets and then you're going to get something like this. Yeah, and that's it here. This is a, a solution what we did. Yeah, one thing I forgot to mention here is if you look at the slider, if I slide it quickly, you can see the plot keeps changing because there is this delay and Ubermag tries to read all the points in between over which you and for the, with your slider. So what you can pass is you can find pass this continuous update equals false 
and then you don't have that problem. So as you drag it, nothing changes until you drop and then it changes. Yeah, small trick. Okay, last thing for this tutorial is, as I said, the directory with the same name as the system object name is created. If you want to delete it in the end, this is the function. So you say mc.delete system and then it's going to delete from your directory anything which is related to this system. Be careful when you use it. So that's why I put it in comments here. Okay, sorry about this. Let's have a, a, a five minutes break. Okay, so this was Vertex Dynamics notebook. Now the next other notebooks are much shorter, I think, and quite straightforward. So now let's have a look at how we can define spatially varying parameters. So, so far when we set exchange, ener exchange energy constant or external field or any other parameter, we assumed it's, it's constant and it doesn't change in space. Now let's have a look how we can define spatially varying parameters. So very simple thing we're going to start with is just, I cho here I chose the, the, the simplest energy, the simplest energy term, which is the Zeeman term. And how do we find, define a spatially constant H? Very simple, we just passed a single tuple. Same story here. We import the packages we want, we define the region, we define the mesh. This is the field we want. So this is a single tuple and we create a system and then we say system.energy equals and this is our Zeman. So this H here is this tuple from there. Now here I initialized my state as a random state just so you can have a function. So you have a function here you can copy paste it for later. This is how you can do that. So this basically means give me Give me three random numbers in the range from minus one to one and give me that as a, as a list. And then we pass that function name to value when we define the field and then we just say norm is, is going to be constant and this is the norm. Okay, so this is the field and then if we have a look at our magnetization, you can see it's it's random, it's everywhere. Uh, now we minimize it. We create the minimization driver, give the system to the drive method. And when it's done, we can plot the magnetization now and we can see everything is aligned that way. Uh, now, spatially varying age. There are two main ways how we can do that. One is using Python dictionaries and another way is using fields. So with dictionaries, one thing we need to do is when we define the mesh, so I'm looking at this line here, we said we need to pass the region and we need to pass the cell. But there are a few other things you can pass here as well. One of those is called subregions. And subregions is a dictionary that I created here. And the dictionary is, if you remember from Python basics, dictionary has keys and, the, and has values. This is one item of the dictionary where you have a, I have a key and I have a value separated by colon. And here I give a name to my subregion. I can call it subregion one and subregion two, or I can call it iron and I can call it, I don't know, cobalt and whatever. And these are just region objects, the same ones we use when we defined total region. So the same one is this one here. So I'm, I say subregion one is the region which spans in between these two points, P1 and P2. And subregion two is a subregion which spans between these two points here. So you can see here that I split it along the x direction. So y and z always go from zero to one nanometer. And 
x goes from minus 10 to 0 in one region and then from 0 to 10 in another region. And now this dictionary I created, I pass it here to subregions argument. And now when I create it, I get a mesh. Now, when I want to define a, sub, uh, a spatially varying field, I can use the dictionary again. So I can say now my H is a dictionary where in subregion one, I want this field applied. And in subregion two, I want that field applied. Same story here. I create a system object, but now I don't put the tuple here. I don't get, I don't give a tuple. I give the dic a dictionary I just created here. And then plot it. It's random again. And then we minimize it. And then we plot it. And then we get something like this. So you can see that in the X for X less than zero, we get it in the relaxed magnetization in this direction. Then we get it in that direction. We don't care if it's physically possible to do something like that. Here, I'm just showing you how to define spatially varying parameters. One thing I can show you here is now when we do mesh dot and then there is MPL and K3D for plotting, but you can also see when you define subregions, you also have K3D the underscore subregions and MPL underscore subregions. So you can pull this and then you can get a feeling where how your regions are defined or subregions are defined. Or you can do mesh dot K3D subregions and then you get something like this. Next time we're going to have a look how to change the colors and make those plots but this is a quick thing so when you define the region the, the sub regions you want to have a quick look at how do you arrange them have you covered everything are there any gaps you can use this this quick plot and the last thing how you can change the spatially varying parameter is by using fields uh, field objects so field objects same story we want the field to be spatially varying so i here i define a function according to this rule here which doesn't make much sense but i just wanted something which varies spatially and this is the function so it takes uh maybe for consistency let me just put a point like this which takes a point which is a tuple i unpack the tuple and then i return for every cell in the mesh i return a, i return a vector why a vector? Because H is a vector. If I was varying exchange constant, then I would return a scalar. Like when I defined MS, I returned a scalar. And when I defined the value of M, I, had, I needed a vector. So this is my function. And now I just define a field. Field is defined on the same mesh as magnetization. It is a vector field. And this is the function that we just made. And this is a norm, so I just wanted to normalize the field. And now this H is a field object like any other field object. And anything you can do with field objects, you can do with, with anything you can do with magnetization, you can do with, with fields. So if I say H, give me the plane perpendicular to the Y direction, or give me X, Z, uh, give me the X, Z plane, and then plot it using matplotlib, I get, oops, I didn't run this cell. And then I get this. Next time, maybe quick thing here, you can change the figure size. So you can say, I want it to be for 15 times three, I don't know, to change it. But more details in the visualization part. And now what you need to do, everything is exactly the same. So this is basically all copy paste we had before, but now H is not a dictionary anymore or a tuple. It is a field we define here. And now when I call this, run it, and then when we relax it, oops, we relax it and plot it again, we get the magnetization, which looks something like that. Weird, physically impossible, but just to give you an idea, any parameter in energy equation, dynamics equation, 
can be a dictionary. If you use dictionary, you must have a, uh, you must have subregions in your mesh, or if you don't define subregions in the mesh, you can just pass any parameter as a field. Those fields of parameters for any any energy or dynamics parameter are fields like any other field, and anything you can do with them, you, you can compute averages, you can compute derivatives, or whatever. Okay, so this was spatially varying parameters one. Now there is one quick thing, what you do with exchange and DMI. So here I show an example from one of my papers where we looked at some, some uh, block points at the, at, the, at the boundaries between different, between different grains, so between grains of different chirality, which means the DMI Absolute value of DMI is the same in both grains, but the sign changes. So in one, the sign, in one grain, the sign is positive. In another grain, the sign is negative. Now here, I'm going to show you how to deal with that. So this is a real world example. We have a disc, which is 150 nanometer in diameter, and it consists of two layers. So we have a bottom layer and we have a top layer on, on the disc. Now the bottom layer has 20 nanometer thickness and the top layer has 10 nanometer thickness. The bottom layer uh, has negative D and the top layer has positive D. Same story, I import everything I need here. I define some parameters. So this is the diameter. This is the thickness of the bottom layer, H bottom. H tops, the thickness of the top layer. This is the cell I use to discretize. Here we use iron germanium, so the right way to discretize it, oops, the right way to discretize it is using less than three here, but here I put it five just to make it make it faster for these demonstrations. Uh, uh, yeah, where I hear, yeah, I, yeah, too many details here, but then I have two subregions. I call it region one and I call it region two. Region one is you can say, it goes from minus d half to d half in x and y directions, but in the z direction goes from minus hb to zero, and the region two goes from zero to h top in the second, in the second subregion. Then here is a quick shortcut. I don't remember if I showed you that last time. So far, I showed you you need to create a region, and then you pass that region to the mesh, and then you pass that mesh to the field. A quick shortcut is if you don't want to define that region object, you can just pass P1 and P2 to the mesh directly, and then mesh is going to create the, the region internally. So here we define the mesh. I pass points P1 and P2. This is the number of discretization cells I want in each direction, and these are the subregions I defined. So if I look at my mesh, my mesh looks something like this. This is the region, and this is one discretization cell this orange bit here. And I can also plot the subregions. So we have 20 nanometer bottom layer and 10 nanometer top layer. Now we define the system object. How do we do that? Let me put this on top maybe just to make it clear. So we define the system object, mm.system, and we give it a name. I here call it a block point. And now the parameter D, we said we want it to be ne negative in the bottom layer in region two or one, I, yeah, let's say positive in the bottom layer or R1, and in R2, exactly the same value, but the same absolute value, but now the negative. Now, what to do between those regions? So, as you know, the DMI, like exchange, is, uh, is the nearest neighbor interaction. And you, you need to know what to do at this boundary. So when you look at one magnetic moment at the boundary, you must know how does that point interact with another discretization cell across that boundary. And you can, by default, if you don't specify it, it's going to be zero. So you're going to have two completely decoupled regions. 
but if you want to specify be specific what happens at those boundaries then you do write a key which is like this so r1 colon r2 as a string that means this is the value of d at that boundary here so this is d which is a dictionary spatially varying two values in two regions and specified what happens at the boundary ms it's constant doesn't change and exchange energy constant now if you remember we said it with uh, our sample is a disk so we need to create a disk function so how do we make a disk we defined ms we defined a norm so our norm is going to take for consistency let's call it a point it takes a point we unpack it and then we say if x squared plus y squared is less than the radius squared, we give ms, return ms, otherwise we return zero. So our system.energy, so this system object is the one we created here, dot energy is going to be mm.exchange, a, which is a constant, mm.dmi, d is now this dictionary here, and here I pass the crystal class. So here we're in iron germanium. So we have the, the, the crystal crystallographic class T. So I pass this, this means bulk DMI, and then we need DMAG. We don't have field here. And this is my initial magnetization. My initial magnetization is just a field mesh. Now you should know this mesh is the one cre we created before. And if you remember, that's where we specified subregions. And because we specified subregions, that's the reason why we can define D like that. Otherwise, we would have to use a field object. So mesh, dimension three, value, it just uniform in the Z direction, and this is our MS. Now, if I plot my sample, so what I do here, system.m.norm, and k3d non zero. So if you remember, this should give us our sample. So something that looks like a disk. Now let's minimize it. We create a minimization driver and we drive the system. And then we're going to plot it. And then when I plot it, what is new in this plotting line here is, uh, let, me, let me go one by one thing here. Maybe it's easier. So system.m. Now let's say we just want to plot the Z component of the field. If you remember, when I went this tab, we had X, Y, and Z here. So I want a Z, and this gives me a field object which is of dimension one. So this is a scalar field. Now I want to plot that scalar field using K3D. But now because I'm plotting a scalar field. I'm not interested in vectors. I can be specific here and say, give me a K3D scalar plot. Now, when we plot it, we get something like that. And if you remember, we had a disk. The reason for that is that K3D scalar, it now acts on this M dot Z. And K3D scalar doesn't know is the value of mz zero because it's really zero or it's because we are outside the sample so this k3d scalar function doesn't know that so what you can do is you can pass a filter field so field so you need to help k3d function a little bit and what is the filter field the filter field is just the norm so you can say, say system dot m dot norm so this works like if this is zero at the cell you want to plot. I'm not going to plot that cell. If this is non-zero at the cell you want to plot, I'm going to plot that cell. And now we have it filtered. So we got rid of all the points where norm is, is zero. So now if we have a quick look, we can, have, we can see we have two vertices, one on the top and one on the bottom and they have different orientation. And now we're wondering what's happening in the middle of the sample. So somewhere in the middle. So I will quickly go through this so I can create a K3D plot. 
like that. And then I, on that plot, I can plot two different planes and then display a plot. So this is how you can plot multiple planes on the same plot. More details later, but here I wanted to show you quick interactive, another interactive plot you can do. So now let's say we wanted to plot uh, system.m dot, yeah, maybe better not, not to waste time much on this. Next time we're going to go into details for plotting. So I'm plotting from my system.m, I'm cutting with the plane. Now I want to vary where I cut the plane. So I want to vary this y. And that's why I put the entire line into a function and I expose this y value. Now this gives me a field and then I call it, I say plot it with matplotlib. We could have used K3D as well. And then I say, I want this to be my figure size, vector scale, I'm going to show you later what it means. And yeah, maybe we don't even need the, that to keep it simple. And now df interact, I decorate this function and I say this argument here is going to be system.m.mesh. Now mesh has also sliders like drive, if you remember from before. And I say, I want to slide through the y direction and I want to turn off the continuous update. And now if I run this cell, I get a plot which looks like that. And then if I go through here, so this is the, we're looking at the disk from the side and cutting it with a plane. So if we, as we go through to the, to the middle of the sample, so the middle of the sample is exactly zero, we get something which looks like that. And then here in the middle is a block point. You see there is a vortex two vortices of the same chirality in the top and the bottom layer, but they have different orientations. So that's why you have a block point here. Uh, main message of this notebook is if you define spatially varying parameter for D, for DMI and for exchange, you must be careful about the value at the boundary. If you don't specify it, it's zero by default and those two regions are going to be decoupled. Okay, now let's go to another notebook, periodic boundary conditions. This is a very simple notebook. Uh, how to deal with periodic boundaries? First in this, so here we are going to simulate a single skirmia in, uh, in a square with periodic boundary conditions. So you can imagine like we cut out one skirmia out of the I don't know, hexagonal lattice and then we, we simulate it. We import everything we need. So we import UMC, discretized field micromagnetic model. We define our region. You can see our region is going to be from minus 50 to 50 in X and Y directions, and it's going to be 10 nanometer thickness. Then I pass that region to my mesh. I say, this is the cell. So discretize it in five times time, five, 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 five nanometers. And this is the point where you specify the boundary conditions. So if you remember, we, the previous tutorials, we had subregions here, but now we're talking about boundary conditions. So you can specify the boundary conditions here. Boundary conditions, if you are talking about periodic boundaries, it can be that. It means it's periodic only in the x direction. It can be periodic only in the y or in the z, or it can be periodic in x and y. It can be periodic in X and Y and Z. It can be periodic in Y, Z, Z and X. So this is the same if I said X, Y, Z. Now, if you look into the documentation, you can also here specify Neumann and Dirichlet, but this is experimental a little bit at the moment. So we're now talking about X and Y. So now we define the mesh. We can have a quick look at it. Yeah, it looks about right. So it is a, a square with some thickness and we have two discretization cells along the, along the thickness direction. Now we define the system object. So the system object is, we call it a skirmia. Our energy equation we have exchanged with this, this parameter. 
we have the DMI, crystallography class CNV. CNV is, for example, cobalt and platinum. So it's an interfacial DMI, gives you nail skermions. Those materials have a, often, you, um, basically always relatively high uniaxial anisotropy out of plane. So zero, zero, one direction for the anisotropy. This is the anisotropy constant. And we also applied some field in the Z direction, 10 to the five amps per meter. And here I just want to show what is the energy. And this is, so we, we have exchange, we have DMI in its uh, interfacial or CNV crystallographic form, and we have uniaxial anisotropy, and we have Zema. Here, I didn't put DMAG, we could have done that because in these materials, DMAG is usually smuggled in through uniaxial anisotropy. Uh, now, we need, like with Vortex, we need to initialize our system in the right way, which means we need to suggest to our system that we want to, to relax to a skernium. Because if we start from a uniform state, most probably it's going to stay like that because of the relatively high anisotropy and a field. So the way we do that with skermions is usually we set the magnetization inside a smaller cylinder in the sample to be in the zero, zero minus one and otherwise to be in the zero, zero, one direction. So you can see here, we, it's like we have a small cylinder and then we say if you're inside 10 nanometers, so if, if you're inside that cylinder with a radius of 10 nanometers, then initialize it in the negative direction, otherwise initialize it in the, in the positive direction. So we can plot it with, uh, we can plot it, this is our initial state. So you can see here we have uh, a small region in the middle, which is like in the negative direction. Now I can minimize it. So I can call the minimization driver, pass the system to it, and then we plot it and we get a skermion. So you can see it's a nail skermion. The periphery of it points towards us and the middle its center points from us so it's we have a full full uh, full range of mz from minus one to to one and in between those two points we have a nail domain wall and this reason for that is because we have cnv crystal class now what if i want to plot only mz or the, the z component same story i just put this z here now this that doesn't have to be there. So I can say system.m.plane and then I can put Z there if I wanted to. Or I, yeah, you can change the, the plane and Z here. So if you see somewhere else where Z is in the other place, at the, at the other place in the, in the line, it's, it's basically the same thing. Or we can plot the Z component. Now what I wanted to smuggle here, yeah. I forgot to say the main thing. If you can see here, we have periodic boundaries. So basically this spin here is looking at that spin over there. If we didn't have periodic boundaries, we would have this additional tilting of magnetization at the boundary due to the boundary conditions of DMI. Uh, or we can plot it using K3D, same story. Uh, filter field, we don't even need it here. I put it just for, for a quicker review because it's a square anyway. And another quick thing I wanted to smuggle here are the lines. So now let's say we want to sample the magnetization along the line which goes through the middle like that. How do we do that? Is we can say, System.m, so this is the magnetization. Look at the Z component, or let's get rid of that as well. So system.m dot line. And now to that for the line, you have to pass two points. So two points between the line, between which the line spans. So we're sampling along the X axis. So we vary between minus 49 and 49 nanometers. Y and Z are always zero. And here we pass at how many points we want to plot it. Now this gives us a line object, which is a sampled field. More details next time about line objects. But you can here say .mpl. And now this is going to give me 
mx, my, and mz of the field, how it varies along the line. So this r here is the distance on the line from the point P1. And this is the value of that. Now, if I just want to show the, the z component, I can either here say y axis equals equals mz. I think this is the way, no. Uh, no, sorry, it's vz. Value z. So I can either do that or I can just say, don't sample the entire vector field, just sample the, the z component or I can just put it, put it there. Now you can also make these plots interactive with widgets and everything. So more details next time. And finally, another thing I want to smuggle in this notebook is how do you do operations on fields? So if you had a look at some paper with skirmians, most often you see these, do you see this formula, which is a skirmian number or a winding number. And if it's one, it's a skirmian. If it's not one, it's not a skirmian. We're not going to go into philosophical discussion here, but let's say this is the formula we want to compare to calculate, okay? So I will make a few empty cells here and let's do that from scratch. So system.m is our magnetization field. With the magnetization field, we do different operations. To make our life easier, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to say m equals system.m just to type less. And if you have a look here, it's lowercase m. Lowercase m means magnetization divided by ms. So I want to have, uh, I want just the orientation field. So this is a normalized field. So this is the m. Now, what do I have here? I have a cross product of derivative along x with derivative along y. So I can say m dot derivative, deriv derivative along the x direction cross product with the derivative along the y direction. Now, what is the cross product? In Ubermag, we use this as a cross product. Now, all that I need to do m dot product with that. The dot product is this. Now, this is what we had. Another thing I forgot to say, this is a surface integral. So we're looking at the, at the plane. So I had to put here plane in the Z direction. So just to have a look at the plane. And then I put all this in brackets and I say, give me a surface integral. And this is my surface integral, okay? Now, what do I need to do with this? I need to divide it by four and I need to divide it with pi. And let's just put it like 3.14. And this is the value of our Skirmian number. So you can say it's not exactly one. It's not exactly one. There are some reasons, numerical, and we have an even number of cells. But operations on fields, this is the way how you do that. You can compute derivatives, curls, lots of different things. So this is the, 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 the recipe, more details in the next session. And this is the solution I, I basically just did previously. Now, because topological charges or skirmian numbers are something we do quite often, I in, we implemented this topological charge as a function already there. So you can just say, System.m.orientation, cut it with plane z and give me the topological charge in that plane. And you can see the answer is almost the same as we, when we do it like that. Or if you want to get a better method of computing it, then there is, we also implemented as this bag Lucia method where we actually basically look, do the triangulation of spins in the sample and then we compute spherical angles between those samples. So this method is much much more clever than that one. So we, if we run it that way, then we can see we get something which is almost one. Okay, 
main message from this notebook, if I go quickly to the beginning, is periodic boundary conditions. You pass BC and define it to the mesh. Uh, everything else remains the same. Plotting, we already had a look into that. New thing is the line object, sampling along lines, plotting different things. Plotting is the next session, how to make these plots interactive, change the labels, make them look nice. And operations, more details next time. Lots of operations are already implemented, so you can just type your equations the way you want, and then you do operations on them. Now, if I go back to my index, current induced very quickly go through that and then you can do the exercise as we planned on your own so what is the idea here the idea here is that we have uh, 500 nanometers uh, nanostrip which is 20 nanometers wide and we discretize it into 2.5 nanometer cells these are the material parameters so we have exchange we have dmi we have uniaxial anisotropy we have gyrotropic ratio, gamma naught, we have alpha Gilbert damping, so lots of stuff there. Now what do we want to do? We want to put a domain wall pair in this nanostrip, apply a spin polarized current, and via Zangli term to push that domain wall pair. This all should be very familiar already. OMC discretized field micromagnetic model. These are just some parameters that we defined. Here we define points P1, P2 cell, we define the region, we define the mesh, then we create a system, and then the system energy is going to be exchange and DMI and unielectral anisotropy. See here we use DMI of class C and V, and the dynamics, we have precession and we have damping. So simple LLG equation. Now the domain wall pair, the domain wall pair is going, to, is going to set the magnetization in the nanostrip along the z-direction. So if we are between 20 and 40 nanometers, we're going to put it in the negative z-direction. If we are outside that part, we're going to put it in 0, 0, 001. So this is the function we defined and we pass that function to the value when we define the field. Norm is always the same because it's a nanostrip. And then when we, when we plot it, this is what we what we defined. So we defined it's zero zero one direction wherever it's yellow, and then in this small region here it's in zero zero minus one direction. Now we relax the magnetization, so we create the minimization driver, and then we drive the system. And then if I plot it again after it's relaxed, then we can see now the domain wall pair is relaxed. Why I call it a pair? Because it's one domain wall is here, when it goes from yellow to blue, and then when it goes from blue to yellow, it's another domain wall. And now what we need to do, we need to push it with current. Now, if you remember from the vortex dynamics, what do we need to do? We just need to add a new term to our dynamics equation. So I add a new term, I say system.dynamics equals mm.zangli. And here I put the velocity and I put beta. Yeah, but let's not worry about those parameters. We just need something to move it. And now we're going to run the time driver. Time driver, run it for half a nanosecond and save it, let's say 100 steps. And then when we're done, we're going to, from the system object, take the, mag take the magnetization, look at the z, component of, of M, cut it with the plane, and then plot it as a scalar field. And now you can see the domain wall from there, it was, it's pushed to this side here. And here, interactive plot. So again, with K3D, more details next time. So basically, it's, the story is the same. Just with K3D, it's a little bit more, you need a little bit more steps but now how to plot it. So we can see here, if we are here, we move the, the main wall, we zoom out a little bit. You can look, look at different steps, how the domain wall moves. Exercise here, you can go through it if you want. And yeah, main message here, just how is you can change the energy equation between different runs you can change the dynamics so now we could what we could have done we could have 
after this time drive here, we could have changed the current direction in the opposite way and then run the time driver again. So multiple drives in the same notebook, changing parameters in between, and that's it. And now as the last step, I want to show you the exercise I did quickly in the beginning. So if you want to do that, you should be able to reproduce the results from this uh, uh, nature com paper where they put the domain volt pair in this narrow region, push it with the current and they get the skirmion here. Here I put the summary of all the parameters you need to use and the procedure, what do one, two, three, four, five. And there is a solution here. So you can have a look at the solution or you can try to do it from scratch. Try to go to different notebooks, look at what we did, like skirmian numbers and try to compute the skirmian number for this. Interactive plots, try to play with it with different things, different, different uh, energy terms, dynamics terms, but yeah. So this is what I wanted, what I planned for today. Now let me have a quick look at if there are any questions. Okay, as I understand, Hans and Ryan answered all questions directly. So, yeah, no more questions as I understand. Let me check if there are any in the chat. Uh, okay, so there's one question, I'm not sure why, but I always get object has no attribute k3d vector for system.mk3d vector. Okay, the reason for that is that probably you have an outdated version of Ubermag. So you need to run, I will put it in chat, conda update Ubermag. And that should pull the, the newest version of Ubermag. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. So the next session is going to be plotting data analysis. So how to build those interactive plots I just showed you, line plots, uh, table plots, uh, K3D, Matplotlib, how to customize them, make them nice for papers. And we have, we're going to have a look at operations. So how to compute, uh, how to compute the effective fields, how to compute the energy densities, and how to, yeah, basically do any mathematical operations with fields.